it took me a, a while to realize as a kind of student that the way I saw things being done in, in Sino-Tibetan was not really quite how they were done in Indo-European. And then uh, as a kind of um, companion piece to my 2019 book, then I, I put a, an article together that kind of discussed uh, this, this contrast in methodology between um, what, we, what, what I was seeing happening in Southern Tibetan and what I, I, I think is more normal uh, in, in, how can I say, it, traditional historical linguistics. Uh, and, that, uh, and then I teamed up with an Indo-Europeanist to make sure I didn't make any serious uh, uh, mistakes. Uh, that's Hannes Fellner, who's at University of Vienna. And the article was published, and maybe uh, one or two of you know about it, uh, but it's, it's fairly detailed and I think um, gets kind of to the core of the way I think about methodology. So, you know, with your uh, permission, <laughs> uh, uh, I, I'm, I've based that lecture around that article. So, um, so hopefully it will, even if, even if you've maybe seen the article, it will still, this vari variant format will, uh, will still uh, prove sufficiently uh, interesting to you. In any case, it's what I have to say, so, uh, so here goes. So uh, I'll discuss, uh, you know, you may, <laughs> may come to realize this is kind of uh, preoccupation of mine. First, a little bit about the history of scholarship, and then I'll be discussing this uh, this idea that in in Chinese linguistics specifically is is called a word family, uh, but then in Tibeto Burman uh, associated with the kind of theoretical writings of James Mattisoff has been come has come to be called an allofam, uh, based on where fam is family and allo is like in allomorph or or, or allophon, uh, but you can see allofam and word family is basically meaning the same thing. And then I'll look through, if you like, different types of relationships that I think have been covered by this term, uh, and then have a conclusion. So uh, as a starting observation, uh, word families or allophams are, are discussed a lot in, uh, in Sino-Tibetan linguistics, but not really in Indo-European. For, for example, or, or other traditions of historical linguistics. So let's look at where um, the term was coined. This is an article by uh, Bernard Cogren, um about word families. So I'll just read it. He says, it is not allowable to identify Chinese mu with Tibetan mik so long as we have not first established the word family to which mu belongs. Akin to mu is undoubtedly the word, uh, I don't know the reading of this one, but probably also something like mu, <laughs> uh, which means pupil of the eye. And it is just as likely that this word uh, is the one that corresponds directly to Tibetan mik. And I, I think there's, um, you know, kind of, how can I say? There's a reasonable point here, which is that, uh, it's not always words with exactly the same meaning that correspond across related languages. Uh, but I do find his formulation, it is not allowable, a little bit strange because it's kind of a, a, you know, a moral position rather than a scientific uh, methodological position. Right? Okay. So um, that's all Calgren said, although he's definitely the person who, who invented uh, word families. Uh, but Stuart Wolfenden, who followed uh, quickly after him, um, gives a more elaborate d discussion of what he sees as the kind of uh, methodological program. So here we go. He says, uh, in pursuing comparative studies of the vocabularies of Sino-Tibetan languages, we are today possessed of two methods of approach. The first of these, and the older, is that of setting up simple word equations from language to language. The second, that of comparison by word families only, taking the family as the smallest operating unit. The first method passes from language to language, lifting single words from each without delving down in any way into what we might call the soil beneath them, 
so that uh, we might, in fact, term such surface operations the horizontal method. Uh, we have, as it were, plucked a flower without looking to see which bush we were looking uh, at. at. Do you say we took it. Uh, the second method, on the other hand, seeks in the first place not to set up equations between single words in two or more languages, but first of all to gather the word families of each separate language, and only then, after we have gained a clearer view of the general background of the words composing them, uh, to, to begin comparative work. This method, from the fact that we did dig down into the soil, as it were, from which the individual words have sprung, we might, if we wished, call the vertical method. We have then not only the flower, but the actual bush on which it is growing. So a nice sort of gardening metaphor from Wolfenden. And I should mention that the context is uh, he's criticizing uh, Walter Simon, who, uh, who had an early paper on uh, Tibetan and uh, Chinese comparisons. So as it happens, the proposals that uh, Wolfenden goes on to to try to uh, exhibit his methodology with in, in terms of saying like, see, if you did it this way, you'd make a mistake. And if you did it this way, you'd do it right. Uh, all of his proposals are, are no longer believed to be right. So, so let's say I think <laughs> prima facie that maybe suggests that his, his methodological views are, are maybe not 100%, right? But of course, any method can also lead to mistakes. So we shouldn't kind of be too hard on him and he was writing a long time ago. But in case that's the sort of, uh, I think how, how the, the, that's how Sino-Tibetan came to see itself as uh, needing a different method than was being used in other fields. And then uh, Matasoff comes along on the tibetan burn side and says, uh, when he's coining this term alifam, he says, we need a word to refer, refer to the relationship among the various members of the same word family. I think the, 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 the observation I would make at this point is uh, we haven't seen anyone define what a word family is or how you can tell whether two words are members of the same word family. It seems to be a kind of art and not a science. You know? And then about the, the criticism that, that uh, I don't know, that, ha that operating with word families is messy, uh, this is what Matasov says. He says, uh, we must assume that the proto-language itself was awash with allophamic variation, both systematic and unsystematic. Why should a proto-language be any more monolithically invariant than any living language that we can observe with our own eyes? No language is ever perfectly regular at any stage of its history. And this is a, let's say, a criticism that... Um, is, is often made towards sort of traditional historical linguistics. I think in the first instance by people like Suhart in, um, in, the, in, in the tradition of um, romance linguistics, uh, that, that historical linguistics in the Indo-European tradition is overly hair splitting and, uh, uh, and sees, um, you know, kind of insists on uh, cleaning up any mess that it identifies, whereas in fact we know languages in reality can be a little messy. But uh, as an extreme case, in, in this same article, or, or book actually from 1979, uh, Matasoff himself reconstructs 21 different variant forms of the word for lung. And, um, and I uh, personally find that a little bit, uh, you know, strains credulity. Like no language I know has 21 similar words for lung. Uh, but are cases like this precedented methodologically? Um, what I will now look at is, is the closest thing to word families in Indo-European linguistics, which are, which are called doublets, and they're something that Matasoff himself draws a comparison to. In terms of, he says, you know, my allophams are like the Indo-European as doublets. So let's look at doublets. So I, I, this is what I just said, that, that, that uh, Matasoff says doublets in Indo-European are what we mean by word families in, um, in Asia. 
And uh, a reviewer of our paper kind of made a similar point that, that Matisoff has also made from time to time, that in Indo-European, we have things like oblaut grades and root affixations. Uh, and and if, if Indo-Europeanists can get away with that kind of uh, you know, association of different forms of a word, despite having different oblaut grades or different root affixations, uh, then we can do similar things in Sino-Tibetan, no problem. So, uh, that reviewer drew attention to the following entry in the American Heritage uh, uh, Dictionary, which is an English dictionary, it has an appendix of Indo-European roots. So here we have the Indo-European root wek, which means to speak. And we have uh, the O-grade form, wok, which gives us uh, Latin vox uh, and words like vocal, voice, and vowel in English, and gives us Greek ops, uh, which comes into Greek uh, with the word calliope. We have a suffixed O grade, so wokwa, which gives us all of these words, all from vocare in Latin. And then we have a suffixed form in the in the E grade that gives us uh, you know th th these these other these other words. So. Isn't this a word family? You see, you see these different competing variant reconstructions. So let's look at uh, this example in, in more detail. So we have the root wek that uh, in the aorist, uh, which is a, is a past tense of, of Greek and Sanskrit and, and Indo-European, uh, it would have been wekweo, uh, which gives us avochat in, uh, in Sanskrit and apon said in, in Greek. So the, so the, so uh, from this root, we can make a root noun uh, that gives us uh, vox in Latin and ops in, in Greek. Uh, and then as far as this, uh, second form that that um, that uh, that we discussed uh, above this this suffixed o grade. If you just project backwards from Latin into Indo-European, which is something we call a, a transponent, is a, is a kind of mechanical backward reconstruction from one language. You would get wokwech with this ech suffix, and uh, that's. Uh, what would lead to vocare in Latin. Um, and from a, from a perspective of Indo-European morphology, it's a perfectly legitimate thing to do, uh, but it's only supported by the Italic family. So in this word, it's probably not of Indo-European provenance. It's an Italic innovation by applying this, um, this uh, denominative uh, suffix to the verb for voice. So rather than forming a, a verb directly from the root, they've taken uh, the, the root noun and applied a suffix, a denominative suffix to it. And, and that uh, is how you get this verb in Latin. Okay, so that's the second option. And then in the, in the third, we have uh, an, another sort of known way of forming nouns in Indo-European. Uh, which has to do with an accent class. I won't get into it too much, but the accent class is called protokinetic, and it's an S-stem. So this gives us um, apos in, 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 in Greek and vachas in Sanskrit. So those are the three, you know, uh, let's say earlier we were looking at how they're presented in the American Heritage Dictionary. Here they are. Uh, and now I'm saying it's not really the case that they're just kind of three variant forms. We have ways to explain uh, them as, as morphological derivatives from a single root. So in, in a sense, there are only two variants. Uh, one is the root noun, because the second variant is formed from the root noun uh, through, 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 through a suffix that changes it into a verb. Uh, and the second one is an S stem. So now if we look at uh, the, the, the English words, these are these, all these different words in English uh, 
are are borrowed from either Latin or French uh, one one way or another. The, or the details are are there. No point going through it. So we have this long list of uh, of Latin words, uh, and um, they are either nominal or or verbal derivatives of the same uh, Latin word vocare. And all of the morphology that relates them was uh, productive and transparent in Latin synchronic grammar. And the developments from Latin in, in, in the Romance languages is also well known and well understood. And you know, when they were attested in English and how they came to, to be used today is also all documented. So all of this you know, apparent uh, uh, word family variation disappears once we look carefully at uh, the linguistic system, use the comparative method, and uh, apply philology rigorously. And that's the kind of, um, let's say, the, the key methodological point that, 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 that we are trying to make is that um, if you see someone talking about word families, it means that uh, they are not quite done with their work, and <laughs> and and uh, instead, if you continue studying the problem and really come to solve it, then you don't need to invoke this idea of a word family. So, uh, you know, that was the the case that was mentioned by this reviewer. All of these words coming from uh, Wekwa in, in Indo-European, uh, which was kind of e easy for us to deal with in a way. Uh, but we want to be fair, uh, so point to a, a kind of really more tricky example. And this actually comes from, uh, for, for, from, from, from Trask's uh, Introduction to Historical Linguistics, and he has a, a dictionary of, of terms in historical linguistics uh, where he looks at different kinds of cognates, and this is his example of an oblique cognate, uh, which are which are words that go back to different forms of the same root. So, so then, sort of, it seems like Trask, who was who was who was someone who worked on Basque, uh, is also happy with this idea of there being different forms of the same root in a proto language, uh, and we're not happy with it. So, we want to <laughs> uh, look at his example and say like, okay, well, if we can deal with this harder example, then that uh, proves our point as well. So we're looking at feather in English and pteron, which means feather in, um, sorry, it means wing more than feather, but means feather and wing in, uh, in Greek. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know, I assume most people probably know the word, but it comes up in English words like helicopter, is is a you know is a is a wheel like wing, <laughs> and uh, a, a pterodactyl is a is a uh, as a dinosaur with with wing fingers. Yeah, so uh, so it so the Greek word comes up in English as well. Uh, so here are the let's say if you like the transponent again. If 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 we just take the English word and throw it back according to regular phonology into Indo-European, we would get this pet rech. Uh, and if we did the same with Greek and said, okay, we just throw the Greek pteron in, in back into Indo-European, we would get ptero. So the point then, let's say from, from the opponent's side <laughs> is uh, these are not the same, right? So if, if Indo-European had both Petrech and Ptero, then it must be the case that there are such things as word families. So now we comes kind of the heavy lifting, and if Indo-European isn't your thing, or you want to just sort of have your eyes uh, glaze over, then that's point. That's that's fine. That's fine. The point is just that we can explain it. So uh, also this will maybe give you a kind of a glimpse of what uh, what an explanation you know of a phenomenon like this in Indo-European linguistics looks like, uh, but but don't you know get too worried about the the details. So originally Indo-European had a, a proto 
kinetic heteroclite, where protokinetic is the accent class, and heteroclite uh, refers to nouns that have an R ending in the nominative, but an N ending in other uh, forms. Uh, and you actually will know uh, cases like this, like water uh, ends in an R in English because it comes from the nominative, but, uh, oh, I don't know, like the Sanskrit word for water has an R in the nominative and the, and the N in the, in the uh, accusative, as does the Greek one. So anyhow, uh, so Indo-European had this kind of accent class and this kind of conjugation pattern for this word. So that means the nominative looked like peter and the oblique stem from which all the other case forms uh, were, were formed was something like peten. And you can see this directly attested in Hittite, uh, which has the nominative petar and the oblique stem petan. So that's, that's the original thing you should reconstruct in Indo-European. Now, how do we get from that to these uh, forms that, uh, that, that we see? So English derives from petrech, which should mean something like a collection of feathers, where this ech suffix uh, is, is, is put on the inherited nominative petr. And um, this is just a, a, a parallel to show uh, this sort of thing happening, but not in exactly the same way, also in Irish and uh, Latin. Whereas Greek uh, instead uh, started from an adjective, uh, a possessive adjective that meant feathery thing uh, that came from peter, which itself was, was an analogically renewed uh, uh, oblique stem. And, and uh, we give uh, an analogy of the type we saw yesterday. So uh, let me just kind of talk us through it. So pet, per tu is to perteo, which are two words from, uh, that meant something like crossing in Indo-European. They give us fjord in, in uh, Norwegian and, uh, and port portus, like door in Latin. So that morphology was there. And then if you forgot that the accusative of the word for feather in Indo-European should have been pten, and you sat around wondering, you might have formed this analogy and then you would have come up with an, an answer like pter. Yeah, so um, that's our explanation to use four-part analogy to explain the invention of this alternative uh, oblique stem. And then once you have peter, pter, then you can add the O to it to make an adjective. And then that gets you the form we need in Greek. So uh, thank you for, you know, sticking with me through that. Uh, while it is correct from a certain perspective to reconstruct both peter and Pter in Indo-European, the point is at no moment did any community of speakers have both of those words for, for feather or wing. Yeah, you, you, you have to have forgotten what the inherited accusative is to get to the second one. So, 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 so yeah, so no proto-language had both variants which is to say there was never a moment where we can say there was a word family and both of these were, were variants that were part of that word family. That's the point we, um, we want to make. And uh, just say in fairness to, to Matasoff's 21 words for lung, uh, cases like feather uh, in Indo-European can approach uh, that uh, level in complexity. So in particular, uh, uh, Nussbaum in uh, a 1986 monograph sets up 12 related words for head, horn, and skull in Indo-European. It's a very hard problem that had been, you know, s sitting around for a long time and he tried to 
to solve it, and I think his solution is, is seen as um, pretty good. Uh, and in this 300-page monograph, he explains each of these forms one by one as ultimately deriving from a single uh, noun, uh, kerch, which meant uh, head bone, the bone, the bone of the skull, and uses different combinations of of, of uh, derivational morphology, analogy, semantic change, as the case may be, uh, to get to these various attested forms. So our conclusion is uh, that uh, these 21 forms for, for lung are, is not totally unprecedented or unreasonable, but until each form is rigorously accounted for in an, an elaborated theory of Sino-Tibetan historical phonology and morphology, it's not uh, helpful to describe these as members of a word family, but instead just as problems to be solved. So, uh, so, so that was the sort of first section, and now I will go through uh, different phenomena that we think have come to be described under this rubric, uh, alifam or word family. And we'll start again with where Matasoff um, kind of defines things, because I, I, I think that kind of when he initially came up with the idea, he was not very far from uh, traditional perspectives. But over time, as the discipline has gotten used to talking about word families, it's become a way of kind of avoiding progress rather than making progress. So this is what he says. He said, word families are groups of forms which bear a non-fortuitous phonological and semantic relationship to each other. The sound meaning relationship among the aliphams of a word family may follow a more or less productive pattern, so that in favorable cases, uh, variations may be traced back to systematic or at least plausible alternations in the proto-language itself, often involving proto-affixations. In many cases, however, the synchronically observable intra and inter allophamy follows no particular pattern that repeats itself elsewhere, which is to say, I, we would in, agree entirely with that, put that way, which is basically when it's easy to figure out, it's easy to figure out. When it's hard to figure out, it's hard to figure out. Um, so he uh, goes on to say, the situation may result from conflicting or overlapping morphological processes that obscure each other's outputs unsystematic or sporadic uh, increments to root, roots, inference or contamination from genetically unrelated forms, dialect mixture, or of course, it is always possible that the forms in question were never co-alephems at all, and their resemblance is entirely specious. So again, the, in, in formulating his proposal for, for, for alephems, he recognizes that they have multiple possible origins and that in, in principle, we should figure out what those origins are. So um, looked at carefully, uh, we think each alifam tells a story that combines in some measure regular phonology, borrowing, and analogy. So, so we're ba back to sort of basics. You know, in, in the history of language, there is phonology, borrowing, and analogy. So let's just try to stick with those and not bother with word families. So, so now uh, we'll go through uh, examples of different phenomena, both looking at an Indo-European case and looking at a Sino-Tibetan case that has been analyzed as uh, a word family that, that we propose should be analyzed along the lines of the Indo-European example. So first, dialect variation, uh, misanalyzed as proto-variation. So, Hopefully, some of the, 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 the Indo-European cases are, are familiar, uh, just to make it a little bit easier, so, which is that we've tried to, to, to choose simple ones. So all English words that begin with V are loan words, like very is from verre, and vicar is from vicar. Uh, but what about vain, vat, and vixen? Uh, because if you look at uh, German, they have quite good Germanic etymologies. Fana, uh, which means flag, Fass, which is barrel, and uh, Füchsen, which is the same as Vixen, right? So, so why aren't they, uh, why don't they have an F in, 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 in English? Well, 
a very strict application of the comparative method would would require that you you reconstruct some kind of variation back into Proto-Germanic, where you had uh, the V for vein, vat, and vixen that let's say changed to an F in in German, because it's a different correspondence than you see, for example, in Fox uh, to Fuchs, yeah, where both languages have F. But that's not uh, right. That would be wrong, and, and we can tell that in the history of English alone where uh, vein was fana, that was fat, and vixen was something like fuchan, yeah? So the answer is actually that these are interdialectal borrowings, and the, the, can the canonical explanation is that in Somerset dialect, uh, they changed all of their Fs to Vs, and so they said things like vish instead of fish, and var instead of far, and that there was, as it was a, a kind of concentrated immigration from the Somerset region to, um, to London at one point. Uh, and for, for some reason, and this part is maybe a little bit where, where the card comes out of the sleeve, why was it that mainstream English borrowed uh, these three words specifically from the Somerset dialect? Well, you know, uh, that's, that's one of the ways I think that historical linguistics is history, right? They, they could have borrowed different ones. So uh, another example uh, for, of inner dialectal uh, borrowing uh, from Sanskrit. So Sanskrit R and L both correspond to both R and L in other Indo-European languages. So I'll just look at some examples. So R corresponding to R, we have a Raji direction in, in, in uh, Sanskrit corresponding to Orego reach in Latin, in Greek, and rego, uh, guide or steer in Latin, and English, right. So uh, we have R in all the languages. Beautiful, we reconstruct R, right? But we also have corresponding to L, where we have rochati in Sanskrit, it shines, which then corresponds to things, I'll skip the Hittite and Tocharian, things like uh, leukos, bright in Greek, looks light in Latin, and English, light. So here we have R in Sanskrit corresponding to L in other languages. Then we also have L and L. So loka, world in Sanskrit, corresponding to lucus, sacred grove, for example, in, um, in Latin. And then we also have L and R. So uh, something like loha, copper in Sanskrit, corresponding to rudus, lump of bronze in Latin. So again, according to the sort of uh, textbook version of the comparative method, we would have to set up a different proto-segment uh, e for each of these in Indo-European. So, so the RR one would clearly be an R and the LL one would clearly be an L, but then what about the RL and the LR? So four, four liquids in Indo-European? Well, no. Uh, for one thing, often Sanskrit itself has internal variation like hair, you have both Roman and Loman in Sanskrit. Uh, where, where external comparisons suggest R. And another example is Rohita versus Lohita, meaning uh, red. But also, if you, if you do your philology, uh, in those cases where both R and L are options in Sanskrit, R is more prevalent in older texts and more Western texts. And L is more prevalent in the East and in uh, younger documents. So this suggests that uh, there were sort of two early dialects of, um, of uh, Sanskrit, one further in the West, which is also where the older documents are from, and one further in the East. Uh, and the one had an R, changed everything to R, and the one changed everything to L. So, so, so what you get is a collapse of R and L into a single segment and then a split, a kind of unconditioned split of R and L uh, again. And that's the explanation of why you have those four correspondences. So now I look at uh, an example from Chinese of dialect, uh, inner dialectal borrowing. So uh, some phonetic components in middle Chinese have both uh, ya final and n final readings. So uh, here's nan, 
and nay, and you can see that the whole character none is sitting on top of the radical meat in the second character. Uh, so if uh, you know uh, ph uh, phonetics are used to uh, represent sound, you would expect the second one to be none, but it's not, it's nay. So that's the kind of phenomenon we're interested in. Uh, and we can't propose either final N or final Y because there are series, uh, phonetic series, that are that have clearly one or the other. So I give this this first example where every member of the series has a final N, and then the second example where every member of the series has a final Y. Although, if you look at the middle Chinese readings, they don't have that. That's because of a, a kind of late sound change, which is why I've added the reconstructions of, of the rhyme. Um, so, so, yeah, which is to say, uh, we, we have solid reason to, to have the pure N series and good reason to have the pure J series. So how are we going to handle these, these uh, mixing N and J series? Well. Sergei Starostin proposed that in Old Chinese there was a separate final R and these series that mix N and uh, Y are evidence of this original final R that in the West changed uh, into N and in the East changed into Y and then its subsequent dialect mixture that, uh, that leads to these mixed series. So, uh, so generally the reading tradition continues the Western readings, but for some characters, uh, for whatever reason, they were borrowed from the Eastern dialect into mainstream Chinese. And that's why you have the Ya series. So this proposal is actually a little controversial in, uh, in Chinese linguistics, uh, but I'm convinced of it. And I think it's, it's, making uh, the evidence is, is pointing more and more in that direction over time. Uh, so in any case, now you've seen an example uh, from English, an example from Sanskrit, an example from Chinese of inner dialectal variation. And I think that some of um, Matasoff's uh, proto variation can be explained along these lines. So he reconstructs a root that means good, where he gives three forms, liak, liang, and madyak and points to Tibetan jak as evidence for this. But actually in the dictionary he's using, Yeshka, uh, the, the, the dictionary author, points out that this is a, what he calls a vulgar pronunciation of the normal Tibetan word yak. So it's a, it's, it's a borrowing from, from a Tibetan dialect that has regularly changed ya into ja back into Tibetan, not recognizing that that was a Tibetan internal inner dialectal borrowing. Matasoff projects the variation back to the proto language. So that's uh, our first, you know, e example of some some word families are are not real because they're uh, inner dialectal borrowing this that have been misanalyzed as proto variation. So now uh, the next case is non etymological resemblance, uh, anal misanalyzed as proto variation and. I start with the classic uh, example of Deus and Theos. So Deus uh, is the Greek, uh, the, sorry, the Latin word for God, and Theos is the Greek word for God. And early Indo-Europeanists assumed that they were related because they look sort of the same and they have the same meaning, but they're not. Uh, and it was only when we figured out all of the sound changes in both languages that you could really prove that they weren't related. And uh, let's just look, I think, a fun example of habeo in Latin and English have which look uh, too similar to uh, not be related uh, and mean the same thing. Uh, but in fact, you have two different uh, Indo-European roots here. One is kep, which gives us capio, which is to take in Latin and have in English. And then the other one, which is geb, uh, that gives you habeo in Latin and give in English. So those are the correct comparisons. Now, the question is, uh, maybe we could call kep versus geb uh, aliphams or, 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 or you know, word families, members of a word family. And I don't think there's anything, oops, I don't think there's anything wrong with that in, in, in 
in theory, because you know, what are the chances that uh, that Indo-European had two unrelated uh, words for to have or to take uh, that uh, both started with a, uh, a velar and both ended in a labial, something like that. But no known process in uh, Indo-European uh, historical phonology or morphology can relate these two roots. So they're treated as unrelated roots. And I think that's the prudent thing to do. Um, now looking at an example from, uh, from Sino-Tibetan, Matasov reconstructs a word, uh, meaning iron. Uh, that he sees as having cognates uh, in in Tibetan and Burmese, uh, so chak in Tibetan and jak in in Burmese. But uh, native Burmese words never begin with voice stops, so uh, it can't be right. Also, the semantics I think are weak comparing iron to bridle bit. It is not impossible, but they're not strong. Uh, and uh, most maybe or or helpful in this regard is. Clearly, uh, the, the proto sign of Tibetans didn't know iron because iron came after bronze, and bronze and iron were, let's say, discovered by the Chinese in uh, historical times, more or less. Bronze a little bit prehistoric. So, iron is too recent to, to be reconstructable. Uh, and then, you know, I think this case shows kind of some of the principles I was talking about yesterday. Where like well if if the semantics were perfect and the phonology were perfect, you know we might have a problem in terms of well okay I guess we we need to reconstruct iron and then and then figure out you know maybe they were talking about unprocessed iron ore or some other kind of a shiny rock or something like that yeah um, but in this case the semantics the phonology the morphology and the archaeology are all pointing to this being wrong so let's just say it's wrong. Uh, and then, uh, so, now, so now that's another type of phenomena that can be misanalyzed as, as uh, a word family. So now I move on to another one. Aerial words. So let's look at wine in Indo-European. This is a, a fun one uh, because there's lots of similar looking words for wine, but they reconstruct slightly differently uh, into Indo-European. So if you, if you take oinos in Greek and projected back into Indo-European, you get this oichno, whereas uh, if you take vinum in Latin and project it back into Indo-European, you get wichno, which is a little bit different. And there's no obvious way to reconcile this evidence, which means the Indo-Europeans did not have wine. And the, the, uh, the, the perspective that maybe the Indo-Europeans didn't have wine is helped by noticing that Semitic also has a similar uh, word for wine, as does uh, the Kartvelian family. So uh, what I think most people, this is controversial still, but what most people think happened was that the Caucasus speakers uh, uh, figured out how to make wine and, uh, and gave it a name from their language. And then that name spread with the commodity quite quickly uh, after the Indo-European language family had already broken up, but not very long after, which is why uh, these different Indo-European words uh, point to quite similar protoforms, but that are irreconcilable. So um, this, I think, uh, makes sense, right? The same thing happens uh, more recently, like I was saying with coffee, tea, with, uh, with iPods. Uh, and uh, and uh, another similar example, actually, in Indo-European is, is hemp or cannabis. Uh, isn't quite reconstructable. Um, so we can know that uh, the Proto-Indo-Europeans didn't have wine or cannabis, but uh, quite early on in the dispersal of the Indo-Europeans, uh, they got uh, wine and cannabis. And uh, I personally am sort of amused by the idea of uh, someone showing up at a campfire and saying, you know, look at this thing I got from Georgia. You'll, <laughs> you'll love it. <laughs> it's called wine. <laughs> uh, you know, which is what now happens with, uh, 
with things too. So, you know, some things uh, never change. So now looking at an aerial word in, uh, in Sino Tibetan, and I touched on this yesterday, horse. So Matasov actually reconstructs horse, this monstrous thing, smarang. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what all the slashes and hyphens mean, but these are the forms he cites. So marang in Burmese, ramang in Old Tibetan, and mra in uh, Chinese. So they look quite similar, don't they? But uh, the proposed uh, reconstruction violates something that I call Simon's Law. It's a, it's a discovery of Walter Simon's, which is that an MR in Chinese should correspond to a BR in, uh, in Tibetan. So you get uh, the word for a fly, you know, like bzzz, fly, uh, is zbrang in uh, Tibetan and mrang in Chinese. And the word for snake is zbrul in uh, Tibetan and mrui in uh, Old Chinese. Uh, and also, uh, Matasov's reconstruction for horse uh, doesn't work in terms of the finals because you see where Tibetan, where sorry, where Chinese has ah ah with a lot of stop, Tibetan should have ah. Yeah. So let's just look at the the horse forms, right? So if Chinese has mra then Tibetan should have bra, basically, but it doesn't. So we conclude that horse is a vandervoort. That's what the technical term for these um, sort of cu cultural technological words that spread quickly across language families. Uh, and this is supported by archaeology, as I mentioned uh, yesterday. So moving on to another kind of uh, source for proto variation. Uh, one is overlooked to sound laws. So Sagar in his, in his review of Matasov's handbook says that he has missed a sound correspondence pointing to this, uh, which is a G in Tibetan corresponding to a W in Burmese. And this is a fun sort of tit for tat between uh, Sagar and uh, uh, Matasov if you, you know, are bored some, some rainy afternoon. So uh, Matasov dismisses round uh, because he prefers to, uh, re to, to, to compare Wan in Burmese to Val in Mizo. And I don't even quite know what his logic is, but anyhow, that's what he says. It's, it's, um, it's not related to, I, I, I guess it's that he thinks it should be an L final and not an R final in Tibetan, but it's, it's not totally clear. And then he accepts the comparison of groma, uh, which is some kind of root vegetable, uh, to, uh, to wa in, in Burmese. But this is what he says. It says the only way to make sense of it is to assume a form like grwa, which was treated by Burmese as having a double prefix gra. So Sagar paraphrases that opinion as saying, Burmese has treated, see, he says, Burmese has treated G and R as prefixes, understand, has lost G and R as a result of untold random processes, so that only W remains. And I think that's a good, a good paraphrase, uh, which, is, which is what, you know, uh, my co-author Hannes and I are objecting to. So, uh, uh, and, then, and then just by way of reminder, so he says, Madison says, uh, the only way to make sense of this, so... I just want to point out that uh, there are other ways to make sense of them. So, for example, Armenian changes wa into ga, which is why we have the word work in, uh, in English, but the Armenian word is gork. So if Armenian can change wa to ga, why can't, uh, why can't Tibetan? I'm not necessarily that I am proposing that. That's actually not the solution I propose in my book, but, but it's just to say, I think whenever someone says there's only the only conceivable answer is blah, it should raise a red flag in your mind. I think maybe there's is more about someone's lack of imagination than uh, than anything else. Okay, and then uh, uh, next I come to contamination, and contamination is a is a type of analogy, but a very specific type uh, that that I, and I mentioned this before, where words that are part of a sort of semantic subsystem uh, influence each other's forms. 
So the textbook example is uh, female, uh, which should be femelle, uh, has been influenced by male. Looking at an Indo-European example, uh, the Indo-European word for four is quetwar, uh, which uh, turned sort of randomly in Proto-Germanic into having a P initial. So it became petwar, uh, and then fedwar, which gives us four, for example, in English. Uh, and this is under the influence of the P in five, where, where Greek and Sanskrit show you that P had, had a, uh, sorry, the, the word for five had a P. So basically, the Proto-Germanic speakers copied the P of five back onto four. And uh, I think something like this happened in, in Sino-Tibetan, where Matasov reconstructs Laba, la, sorry, Lubunga for uh, five with either an L or a B prefix. Or, but actually, this is a sort of problem with using slashes in your notation. I'm not quite sure. Does it mean either an L or a B, or does it mean either an L or a B or nothing? Or does it mean either an L or a B or nothing, or both an L and a B? Um, but in any case, uh, it means something along those lines. So uh, we think the L is etymological, which is to say Sino -Tibet, the Sino-Tibetan word for five was lunga, like we get in Tibetan and in Dakpa. Uh, and we think that uh, words like mizu panga with a P, the P has been copied from four. So. Uh, sort of, you know, like almost the mirror image of what happened in Germanic, where Germanic copied a P from five to four, and we, th we think the P inside of Tibetan was copied from four to five. Uh, and you see that, that uh, in, in the word for four, both Mizu has a Pa, and Tibetan has a Pa, and Kurtop, which is a, a language uh, spoken in Bhutan, as is Dakpa. So that's our explanation, is, is the B is new, uh, caused by contamination, the L is old. And uh, moving then on to our next, you know, type of cause of uh, seeming word families is misanalyzed uh, language internal uh, developments. And uh, this basically is a point about philology, where we're studying texts in the original, uh, especially early texts, has been uh, the a sort of staple of uh, Indo-European, whereas it seems not to be very popular in Sino-Tibetan. And uh, let's look at the, the, the root right. So Matasov reconstructs a root for Sino-Tibetan bre, which means to draw or to write. And he says that this is on the basis of Tibetan aliphams like adriwa, sorry, I should pronounce it in Old Tibetan, a briwa, draw or write, bris, a picture, and ris, figure form, and rimo, uh, on the other hand. So basically, uh, let me just make clear. The first two support the B, the second two don't support the B, which is why he has the B hyphen. Because he's saying, oh, the B can kind of come and go, like you see in Tibetan. But actually, the old Tibetan conjugation of this uh, verb is different. So it has a D in the present and a B in the past and the future, which is totally regular, according to Tibetan uh, historical morphology. So we think uh, that what happened was the, the, the D-B alternation, although regular, was a little bit uh, untransparent to speakers, so, that, so they generalized the past slash future form into the present, which is to say uh, the... the the, the B in the nominal forms, uh, or, or yeah, the, the two examples that Matasov gives of the B in Tibetan are not, uh, uh, don't prove the claim he's making, because in the verb, it's, it's an innovation, and in the word picture, it's, it's derived from the past. A picture is something that has been drawn, yeah? So the root is ri, and, uh, and no Tibetan evidence supports the reconstruction of the B in Bre. Uh, the present is late and analogical, and, and the word for picture 
is the, derived from uh, the past. And I also just want to point out that it would be really surprising if the Sino-Tibetans had a word for to write. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, maybe that's a little bit unfair as a criticism because it can also mean to draw. And the proto sino tibetan probably could draw or, or scratch. Oftentimes, you know, verbs for drawing or scratching come to mean write. Okay. And then uh, just another example. Uh, Matasov reconstructs the Tibetan word sal to a proto sino tibetan root sal, so gsal, which means to clear, to clear away, like a stain. Uh, but written Tibetan s actually merges two things in proto sino tibetan One is sts and one is s. So if we look at old texts, we can see that uh, that in this case, it's the STS form that's original. So we have Dikpatamche uh, Bstsald, clear away all sins. So this is the past tense of the verb to clear, B-S-T-S-A-L-D. And here's another uh, example from Old Tibetan. Uh, completely clear away all hindrances. So Barche uh, is hindrance, Tamche all, Yongsu completely, Bstsaldte. Uh, with B S T S. So the root is sal, not sal. So the reconstruction to Proto Sino Tibetan must also be wrong. Okay, so th that's my little kind of uh, survey of different, uh, or, or let me put it two different ways. One is survey of the kinds of phenomena that can lead to the appearance of proto-variation. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're saying then that, that proposing proto-variation is never a legitimate move. So uh, word families are a bad idea. Uh, but we want to make the point now, kind of at the, at the end of this, uh, methodological comparison between how historical linguistics is done in Sino Tibetan and how linguistic historical linguistics is done in Indo European, uh, that, uh, that this isn't some great new discovery of ours, right? It's a it's it's a it's a essentially conservative position. Yeah. So August Conradi back in 1896 uh, said about uh, Sino Tibetan that uh, sound laws are what we should be looking for. Now, unfortunately, that, that call wasn't really answered. And then in book reviews of Benedict's 1972 volume, uh, Miller was very um, critical, uh, in particular, saying that, uh, that there is a considerable chasm between uh, Benedict's method and uh, the comparative method with its sound correspondences. And similarly, uh, Zhang Kun uh, said that um, systematic phonological reconstruction is the first requisite for historical work in linguistics, and it is generally absent here. And then for, for sort of specific reasons, the quotes weren't convenient to give, uh, but uh, Tasuo Nishida and uh, very recently George Tarostin have also uh, criticized uh, word families and um, and uh, and aliphams, uh, but for whatever reason, somehow the the mainstream traditional historical linguistics methodology perspective in Sino Tibetan has always been kind of the outsiders looking in. You know, so like Chang Kun, George Tarostin, uh, Miller were all sort of active in Sino Tibetan linguistics, but not as active as uh, Matasoff or Benedict and, and, and their students. So that's the, the end of my presentation on uh, comparing methodology between Sino-Tibetan and uh, Indo-European.